I'm going to talk about why the world is falling apart, uh, the non-place of wisdom in today's world. So I decided I'd start with something serious, and that is why don't space aliens visit Earth? Uh, and there are many serious philosophers and astronomers who believe that the reason is that any civilization that had the intelligence to devise uh, rockets to get here would have destroyed itself before it ever got here. And so I'm going to be talking about that today. Uh, our society and many others use measures of developed intelligence to sort people, and SAT and ACT and tests like that are essentially intelligence tests. They correlate as highly with intelligence tests as intelligence tests correlate with each other. So elevated intelligence, which we use to sort people, has brought us a world of wars, climate disaster, record income inequality, dictatorships posing as democracies, Brexit, and the 2016 election. <laughs> so the question is, what's wrong? Uh, today, there are over 100, 892 hate groups operating within the United States. They're operating in all 50 states. Wealth distribution in the United States is more unequal than ever before. 47% of people could not find $400 to meet an unexpected expense. Mm. So maybe you can, but that means half the people cannot find $400. Mm. 37 nations today are exhibiting serious genocidal activity. A liberal democracy is on the way out in Hungary and Poland, gone in Turkey, and threatened in other countries. Dictatorships have arisen in major nations, Russia, China, Venezuela, and we'll see, but the U.S. may not be far behind. We won't go into that. Uh, so what that suggests is that people who are smart uh, somehow can be foolish. And what I've proposed in the past is that people who are smart are more susceptible to being foolish because they think they're not. Uh, and the way this is manifested is through unrealistic optimism, that they think they're so smart they couldn't be foolish. Uh, egocentrism, it's all about me. Omniscience, uh, I know everything. Uh, we have some presidential candidates who have shown that. Uh, the omnipotence fallacy, that I can do whatever I want because I'm so smart. The invulnerability fallacy, that I can get away with this. The other candidates show that. The sunk cost fallacy, well, I've put so much effort into this, even if the idea sucks, I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, and the ethical disengagement fallacy, that ethics are really important for other people, uh, but I'm past that now. Uh, intelligence, my point is, doesn't save us. IQs rose 30 points during the 20th century. That's the Flynn effect. Are you all familiar with it? So I don't have to describe it good. Uh, but we have to ask what our world has to show for a two standard deviation rise in intelligence. That's incredible. That's just incredible. Uh, we know that IQ is only weakly predictive of various measures of life success, so we unwisely use IQ test proxies, standardized tests, which are really IQ tests under another name, to choose our future societal leaders. That's not working so well. Uh, will an increase in IQ result in an increase in wisdom? Well, we already know the answer, no. Uh, increases in IQ could even result in decreases in wisdom because schools and society may ignore wisdom. After all, it's the, test, the standardized tests that matter. Explicitly devalue wisdom, look at today's election. Uh, implicitly devalue wisdom by emphasizing conventional wisdom at the expense of, in, uh, conventional intelligence at the expense of wisdom. Point being that all these uh, tests we're using, all this schooling we're using, it's, it's going for the wrong thing. Uh, humans have made enormous strides in technology, including destructive technology, without corresponding advances in their wisdom with regard to the uses of this technology, or perhaps anything else. So we have a mismatch between the development of technology and the lack of development of wisdom for using the technology, which places the world at enormous risk. Uh, so wisdom is related to other complex skills. I've argued you need creative ideas to come up creative abilities to come up with ideas, like for your research or your how to deal with your wife or your kids. You need analytical abilities to decide whether the ideas are good. In other words, will the kids do it if I yell at them or if I punish them or if I don't ignore them? You need practical abilities to make your ideas functional and to convince others of the value of the, your ideas, which is what the talks are about today, right? Everyone trying to convince each other that their ideas are really good. And if you have time, maybe listen to the others. Uh, and you need wisdom to balance the effects of your ideas on yourself, others, and society in both the short and long terms. So what I've argued in the balance theory of wisdom is that wisdom is the application of skills and knowledge toward the attainment of a common good 
through a balance among intrapersonal, your own, interpersonal others, and extrapersonal interests, larger interests, over the short and long terms, through the mediation of positive ethical values by acting so as to balance adaptation to shaping and selection of environments. And I have a figure, but that's the basic idea. That it's about using your abilities and knowledge toward a common good uh, and not just looking after your, out for yourself. And that's just, a, I'm going to skip. So what I've proposed is a model for applying positive ethical values, and that is that the reason people tend not to be ethical is not that they couldn't be, but that there are eight steps to ethical reasoning within the context of wisdom. And unless you do all eight steps, you don't act wisely. So for example, if uh, a kid, uh, John, sees uh, Bill uh, cheating on a test, First, he has to recognize that there's a problem, and he may not because, after all, all kid, he might say all kids cheat, oh, so what? Uh, then he has to define the problem as ethical. Is there really an ethical issue here? Then he has to identify the problem as relevant to him. Well, is it any of my business if Bill is cheating, or you know, do I just let it go? Uh, you have to judge the problem as worth your attention. Well, he's cheating, but who cares about cheating on a test? It's only a small lapse. Then you have to identify the relevant ethical principle. Well, you know, uh, I saw him cheating, but what, what, you know, what should I do? I mean, does that mean I'm supposed to get him a You have to apply the relevant ethical principle to the situation. You have to anticipate likely obstacles to ethical action. Then you have to act. And where people mostly get hung up is on the last two steps. And that is when you act ethically, you usually lose, at least in the short term. So most people don't act ethically because they lose friends, they lose colleagues, they get articles rejected, they lose grants. Uh, you get the chairman of the department pissed at you. You get the dean angry at you for not covering the thing up. And then even if you get through that and anticipating the likely obstacles, a lot of people just drop it there and they never act. So we have done a number of kinds of empirical studies. And I see I'm running out of time unwisely. Uh, we did some studies on implicit theories. Uh, and what we found is six factors, reasoning ability, sagacity, learning from experience, environment, judgment, expeditious use of information, and perspicacity. Uh, and we found that the correlations between wisdom and intelligence raised from 42 to 78 with a median of 68, but wisdom and creativity show lower correlations ranging from negative 24 to 48 with a median of 27. So wisdom and creativity are pretty far from each other, and wisdom and intelligence aren't so close either. Then we did some conflict resolution studies, and we found that people have consistent conflict resolution styles, but that the only consistently wise one is step down, which you don't see much of these days. Uh, then we did some cultural studies, and we measured life relevant skills for practical and wise living on five continents. And what we found, for example, in rural Kenya is that knowledge of how to treat parasitic illnesses in yourself and others something really important for adaptation in that society correlates negatively with IQ. Uh, and we found in uh, studying Alaskan kids, the knowledge that's really important for life success, ice fishing, hunting, et cetera, the things that really matter to them don't correlate with intelligence. Uh, in fact, the kids who do best in school are the lowest in these kinds of skills. Uh, then we did some studies in college admission. Uh, things like tell us that how a passion you have today could help you achieve some kind of common good when you're older. And we found that the items increased prediction of academic and extracurricular success. They substantially reduced ethnic group differences, and the students actually liked the items. So just to show you what the data look like, uh, if you just have the SAT, uh, you, you get some prediction. If you add analytical, practical, and creative, you get very much increased prediction. So we, can do we double prediction of academic success by including analytical, creative, and practical measures. We also greatly reduced ethnic group differences. So when you use these kinds of measures, you get much smaller ethnic group differences than you do when you use standard measures. Uh, we're now doing a medical judgment uh, study. We don't have data yet. Uh, students are presented with medical judgment problem. For example, a dying man asked you as doctor to tell his wife after he dies that he had a 12-year-old affair and he never told her about it. Uh, he wants you to tell her. Uh, and it's intended to supplement the MCAT, no data yet. 
uh, we're doing a scientific judgment study. Students are asked to hypothesize about plan and judge scientific studies, including acting as junior reviewers and editors. And we find, found that scientific judgment is weakly or negatively correlated with SATs among Cornell undergraduates. The editor task, the, the most difficult one requiring wisdom, was the hardest. And I just wanted you to see that the, the factors, that our measures are one factor, that's factor two, the first 59, 77, and 78, and SAT and SAT, SAT math and reading are on a separate factor. And if you, these are current data, they're not published yet. And if you look at the correlations, you see that our, the first one, two, three, four, five are negative. So our measure is actually correlated negatively with the SAT, whereas standardized psychometric tests correlated positively, the last two numbers. So as I keep saying, wisdom is really different from general intelligence. Uh, we're doing some ethical judgment studies. I see I'm out of time, so I won't say much about it. Uh, we've done a Teaching for Wisdom project where we taught fifth graders American history in the context of wisdom. We then found that fifth graders were too young. Um, and I, I have to conclude uh, because I'm out of time. So emphasizing intelligence and its proxies has been a disaster. It's a mistake for in our world. Our society needs to get serious about emphasizing wisdom, not just intelligence. They're really different things, and it's possible and practical to teach and assess for wisdom. And I'd be glad to answer any. Those are my triplets. Uh, answer any questions. <laughs> <coughs> So that was great, Bob. I'm interested in the question that you raised about scientific judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and were the correlations for the editor's task or which, which part of the? So here's the deal. We had one was generating hypotheses. One was analyzing a study and saying what's wrong with it. Another one was coming up with your own study. Another one was be getting a whole study and then having to serve as a reviewer, and the last one was being an editor, and you actually were evaluating reviewers. And the first four tests all clustered together and worked very well. The one that didn't work so well was the editor task, uh, and we don't know for sure why, but we think the reason is it was just too hard, uh, that the Cornell freshmen and sophomores were testing the, you know, they've done things like generating hypotheses and evaluating studies, but what they've never done is being an editor, and that's actually evaluating evaluations. And we think the test was just too hard. It requires a kind of wisdom that was beyond what the others did, and we think we went beyond their zone of proximal development. So the correlations weren't terrible, they just weren't as good. They di it didn't cluster as nicely in the factor analysis as the others did. So and it was actually more related to general intelligence. So you haven't, um, you haven't written about this yet? No, it, we just got uh, some of these data, <laughs> some of them I got within the last week. Yeah, so it's not written up. It's, it's ongoing. There's a third study, and the third study is teaching. We have two professors at Cornell doing teaching, and we purposely inserted bad stuff into their teaching. And the last study in the series is that the students have to evaluate what's wrong with the teaching. So we have two on research evaluations and one on teaching evaluation. Bob, uh, yeah. very interesting. I wonder, the connection between your initial model, the balance theory, where, uh, if I understand it correctly, a lot of it is mediated through applying uh, sort of good moral ethical values. How is that component related to this uh, idea that you're currently testing? Uh, with respect to scientific judgments? Because I'm trying to see where are the ethical values there. Yeah, no, that's a fair question. Actually, we just talked about it last night. Uh, so for example, in being an editor, <coughs> what a bad editor does is he gets the studies, uh, he gets the studies, he reads the studies, then he reads the reviews, mm -hmm. and then he does what a computer does. He says, mm hmm, two positive reviews, but three negative reviews, you're rejected. Uh, or, well, this, this review was so negative that I'm not going to accept the article. Uh, so it's kind of like, uh, it's analytical, but it's not very wise. What, what I said last night is what a good editor does, and what I try to do for PPS, is I'll often accept stuff with worse reviews, 
because every reviewer has an agenda. So part of the wisdom of being an editor is seeing through the agendas of the reviews. Mm -hmm. And what I sometimes do is I'll accept an article that the reviewers don't like, but I'll get commentary. So that would be one example. A second example is in the task where you're judging the research. That, so these are the second study, the, the last two. Uh, it's not just about, see, what, what's really crap about most of our journals is that what the editors look for is that there's nothing wrong with the study. And what they should be doing is asking whether it's an important question. And where the wisdom comes in, is this a question worth asking? Uh, even if it has flaws, uh, are the results going to matter? Yeah. And so some of our best journals are run by people with very high IQs who have never done anything wise in their life. And they have positions at really good places. And their work will be forgotten the day after they retire, or the 10 years before. Uh, I had one person at Cornell say to me, well, you know, as you get older, people stop citing you. And I felt like saying, well, that's you. That's right. Uh, it's because the work the person did was analytically strong, but didn't matter. And that's, what, that's what's wrong with our, and that's not just wrong with the journal system. It's not just wrong with our scientific system. That we're too concerned about how people solve problems instead of whether the problems they're studying or even worth solving the first place. Just to quickly follow up on that, if I may. Um, the idea of a good moral uh, sort of ethical virtue system, I'm trying to decompose that. The way you just described it, it sounds like you can decompose a set of metacognitive uh, principles that are sort of big picture thinking, consideration of different perspectives, and so on and so forth. Where sometimes I'm thinking of uh, uh, an ethical virtue system as more about, you know, common sensually agreed on a uh, set of principles, deontological principles, so to say, about what is the right act. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's, so it's, it's interesting because there yeah. seems to be a different way to think about yeah, it. Yeah, it is. I taught, uh, well, you know, I actually have some practical experience. I taught a course last year uh, for undergraduate and graduate students that used my book with Susan Fisk. It's an edited book mm -hmm. on ethical challenges right. in the behavioral and brain sciences. And it's a book of case studies. So most of the course was discussing the case studies. And the way I evaluated the students is in their ability to take a case study and analyze it. And what I found very quickly is that for any case study, people can have really different views on what's ethical. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> when it comes to evaluating, what I ended up doing is how deeply can they see into it? How many different uh, solutions mm -hmm, can mm -hmm. they see? How well can they analyze the positives and the negatives of each right. solution? But if you get into, well, here's the, ethic here's the ethical solution, here's the right one, uh, this is the principle, you really get into trouble. Because for almost any of these real world problems that are in the book, and all of them are real, all of them were by behavioral and brain scientists who are fellows of APS, uh, opinions can differ. So what I, what I argue matters is the ethical reasoning, that eight step model, mm -hmm. rather than I can't, you know, we, you get into, re it's religious school. I mean, y when you get into this is right, this is wrong, what I say in some of my articles is that's a job for religious school and parents. It's not a job for us. Our job is to teach them how to think ethically, to reason, but not this is, there are some things that are right and wrong. I mean, in my longer talks on wisdom, I talk about common e universal ethical principles like you tell the truth, uh, you know, you don't kill. There are some universal ethical principles but when it comes to most practical situations, they're really hard to find. Mm -hmm. the Rhonda, I think, was, was next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much. I really like the studies you presented. Um, I did have a question, though, about the first part of your talk, uh, you know, about the part you know, that the world is the way it is, and it's because um, we don't prioritize wisdom enough. But and I wonder maybe one of the challenges of promoting wisdom is because since we don't promote wisdom enough and the world is the way it is, you know, people voted 5240 for Brexit. We have the election this year. People might look at this idea and think, you know, this looks like an agenda. Why should I support this? You're trying to change my values. So it, it, seems, it seems like we're in a catch-22 situation, right? Like this is a potential solution, but the people may not want it. So <laughs> yeah, so I've discovered. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. do you have any thoughts about how you could get around that? I mean, how, how, how do you get around the pushback? Yeah, I, it's, 
I, I could talk a long time about that. I just gave a talk at uh, a, a conference for top admissions officers, <laughs> and we talked in detail about our admissions officers, and there was a lot of nodding and a lot of clapping, and then I never heard from anyone again. Uh, you know, and I talked about why it's so hard to change systems, you know, and basically, you know, you get a closed system, people get entrenched, they get comfortable with it, they get superstitious about it, uh, they, sometimes they think that, well, you know, SATs have very exact sounding numbers. I, I've gone into some detail about that. Uh, but in the end, systems are hard to change because whatever system you have, people will believe in it. The example I've given is that if we did college admissions by height instead of by SAT scores, uh, over a period of time, and we d actually do use height, but that's another issue. Over a period of time, people in, on Wall Street and people who are scientists and people who are uh, business executives would be taller than others, which they already are, and then people would believe, well, it's because I'm tall. Uh, it, it, tall people succeed. So any system you put in place, royalty, height, religion, skin color, will generate the self-fulfilling prophecy that it's a good system. How do you break out of that hell? If I knew that, I wouldn't be here. I would be out doing it. <laughs> I have not been successful in getting this stuff adopted, and I really wish I could answer your question, but it's hard. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.